There are some very important whitetail habitat features that you need on your land. And these are concepts that I've developed and that I've seen out in the whitetail woods, hundreds of properties, developed them over many years. And to me, they're very important and essential. And a lot of these concepts I talked about in my first book in 2012, Whitetail Habitat Design and Whitetail Success by Design. And that book was critical because to me, I wanted to put these concepts on paper. They're very important. They've helped me. They've helped hundreds of clients around the country. And this concept today is something that is critical. And I'll give you an example here. Um, I call this a paralleling habitat feature. Paralleling habitat features are very important on your land. And they're very important because you want the deer to be positioned and to move on your land so that they're parallel to your borders and stay on your borders, in your borders, inside your land, instead of going off. And I'll give you an example. Here's a property border right here. We're on a ha habitat day a long time ago. I've, I've gone on many habitat days where we talk about what should be done on the land. We take big groups, large groups through. And uh, I usually do that two or three times a year and, and over the past many times. Uh, I used to do a lot more in the past. On a habitat day, particular landowner, food plot about two acres. And let's say it was five times longer than it was wide. Food plot right here, border right here. Big bedding area on one side, big bedding area on the other. And the neighbor had a stand right here about 30 yards off the border. Landowner's pretty upset because that hunter was hunting right on the border. The food plot only ended about 30 yards from the border. The lander's right over here, so 60 yards right here and just across the border. And the landowner here was complaining a lot about his neighbor sitting there. Well, if you're a good hunting neighbor and you know what you're doing, why would you not be sitting here? This neighbor had about 20 acres, small property. He's hunting right there. And the reason you wouldn't miss hunting that, especially as someone that has a little bit of skill and experience hunting, is this food plot right here was running perpendicular to the border. Deer would come out of this cover, bedding areas on either side. They get into this food plot, it's long and narrow, and they turn left or right. If they come out of here, turn left, they're right off to the neighbors. Come out of here, turn right. No, they had just as much chance of turning left and going onto the interior's parcel. But that was one of his large food plots, and that food plot was long and narrow. Deer will follow the length of that food plot if it's a long, narrow plot. So those bucks then follow and go right off the land or in the land, and really bad setup. That is a perpendicular habitat improvement. Instead, let's flip that around. Let's say you have bedding areas, bedding areas, and then you build this food plot, even if it's smaller, doesn't really matter. You build that food plot this way. And then you create heavy screening cover like switchgrass, where deer don't like to bed in switchgrass during the daytime hours because there's no browse within grass. And it doesn't matter if it's big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, whatever it is, in October, November, they're not bedding in there unless they're pushed in there. Big blue stem, little blue stem, all that grass laying down in November anyways in most northern settings or Midwest, upper Midwest settings. So let's say this is switchgrass. Now you have that border you have a switchgrass layer here. Deer aren't encouraged to bed there. You can actually walk right behind it and not spook the deer. Probably 60 yards off, might be 50, 70 yards off the border. But bottom line, this food plot is running parallel to your border. It is encouraged, encouraging deer to stay within your borders, to move back and forth. It helps you set up stand locations. So if you know those deer being dumped into those bedding areas at a certain point, then you can get behind that bedding area in the morning, wait for the deer to come back to you. Same with over here. You can put a pop-up blind or a redneck blind right in the switchgrass, access it with 30 deer out here, right into the back of the blind, some sight windows out, just notch the switchgrass down. It might be that that's red cedar there, it might be spruce, it might be pine, it might be a combination of pine, spruce, and switchgrass. Switchgrass towards the inside, switchgrass towards the south side. Um, getting that full sun doesn't matter what direction this is. My bottom line is you could walk behind that switch grass, get into here. Your neighbor that's over here, why would the deer go by him? You have the access back and forth on your own border. 
the deer are encouraged to go back and forth like this, parallel to, parallel to your border. And then the deer are not encouraged to go into here. There's really not much for, of a reason for them to turn and leave your property. They'll just feed along. And then if there's a subordinate doe right here and a mature doe comes out, typically that doe just move further. Bucks will push deer back and forth. And that's where the beginning of that paralleling habitat feature really works. And it's critical for your land, but it doesn't end there. Typical property. Now let's say it doesn't matter if your house is on the inside of the property. You see me draw a lot of properties where you have exterior access and you're going into that property from the outside chipping away. There's a lot of properties I go to where let's say you have a large, let's just say an 80 acre parcel, pretty common parcel, 80 acres. It might be that someone's cabin, they have a driveway that goes in and then their cabin is right here. So they're driving into that cabin, it's in the middle of the property, and it doesn't matter if you're coming from the outside or coming from the inside, you can still have those paralleling habitat features. And it might be that for whatever reason, let's say there's all big open pasture around here. Let's say it's a neighborhood, it doesn't really matter, but it's an area where you can bring deer every evening to a large food plot and bring them to that food plot and then they can safely exit after dark to an area that I call a dead end. It might be a neighborhood, a golf course. It might be big open hardwoods where they're not stacking here and then coming on. They're actually living on your land and inside out property, which I talk about in another video. They're hitting that food and then they're leaving. Safe place for food. Now let's say the landowner has pretty heavy hunting pressure around here. So pretty good hunting pressure. You create bedding areas, big bedding area here. Could be a big bedding area down here. Could be that you're creating a travel corridor here where you're knocking those trees to the side. You're encouraging deer to travel through there and they have high browse, they have high cover on either side. You're creating a travel corridor. Let's say there's even a little hunting plot right here. Um, so you're creating bedding area, hunting plot, and travel corridor going back and forth. And let's say even down here, you might even have, um, this is an access road coming back into maybe a dead end down here. It might be that for whatever reason you can build a paralleling food plot that just kind of meanders through here because you're trying to get more food on. Maybe this food's three acres on that 80 acres. This is a half acre in size. This is a quarter acre. Bottom line is though, you're connecting these and still encouraging the deer to move parallel to your borders, not off your borders. You could have a travel corridor between this big bedding area, the end of this food, it's just crossing non-invasively across your driveway down here. That allows you to have you might even have exterior access where you can come out on the road you can go around you can get behind this bedding area wait for deer to come back to you in the morning you could slip out on a food plot with north winds right here as they're going back and forth it might be that your yard is right here um, you could slip on the road hunt the back side of this bedding area in the morning waiting for the deer to come back to you you can go over and hunt this side of the food plot maybe you can even come out through your neighbor's horse pasture and they, they allow you to do that or cow pasture or it's a neighborhood whatever it is and you can come in this way hunt on the outside of the food on this side with different winds but it all serves to connect to create paralleling habitat features to move deer back and forth across your property in a parallel fashion and not perpendicular that's how you put these designs together it might be that you're looking at the outside and you're doing the same thing and that instead of your house being in the middle you make bedding area here random timber stand improvement areas in the middle but still boils back down to making those parallel habitat features. Now, when a buck is cruising in this area, let's face it, 80 acres, 40 acres, 30 acres, I hunt on mostly 40 acre parcels, 30 acre, whatever it is, you're typically gonna be hunting bucks that are non-core bucks that are coming from off your land, they're living from somewhere else. It's not to say you don't hold two or three mature bucks on here during the hunting season, because I find you can pack in a lot, way more than scientifically traditionally accepted mature bucks on your land because if their choice is to be compacted on your land in safe remote areas with their own bedding area, in close proximity to another mature buck, say 100 yards away for his daytime hours, they're moving very little during the daylight hours. I feel, and what I've found and experienced over and over again is that those mature bucks will stay on this land if their choice is to remove themselves from the land and be exposed to hunting pressure. So you can really do a lot with just very small parcels. Now think about that buck. It's a non-core buck. He's coming from a mile away. He's coming onto your land at night in mid-October, end of September, whatever it is. He's coming into your land. 
And when he hits this paralleling habitat feature, let's say this is a travel corridor you create, let's say this is a big bedding area, it's a maze and pocket effect, where you have pockets, the deer can move in and out, there's no dead ends. Now let's say there's a long food plot over here, and then you have that connection all leading up to this giant food plot right here. When that buck comes in here, he turns left to right, he follows your travel corridor lines, and now you've got him. You've got his attention. There's a lot of urine scent to there. There's pellet count, high pellet count scent. And then you have rubs and scrapes, a lot of deer traffic on these outside paralleling habitat features. He hits that, he turns left to right. It's like casting a giant 80 acre net out. Anywhere he comes through that on your line, he's hitting that outside travel corridor, paralleling habitat feature, and he's turning left to right. So now you're capturing every buck movement within the neighborhood. When they come on your land, they turn left to right. Instead, if you just have a food plot here, food plot there, you're not working on these connections and travel corridors and habitat, you have open timber in here, he just goes right through. Now your trail cameras, you need three times as many trail cameras on a, on a random pass-through property than you do a property that has paralleling habitat features because I can put a trail camera on the back of this bedding on a travel corridor that wraps around or wraps around the back of this. I can put a camera... I can put a camera on a small harvest plot. I can put a camera watching a big plot, put a camera in one spot that I can access down the road, just zip in 20 yards, 30 yards, remove the car, get it out of there. I can use five or six cameras on this location and it will tell me every buck that is in this giant area within a half mile, three quarters of a mile in every direction because every one of those bucks has a three mile home range. It's almost all at night. When he comes in during the middle of the night, he hits my property, he turns left to right, and now I've got him. Now I have his attention, I have his focus, and it's because of those paralleling habitat features. And it's making sure that I'm casting out that giant net of movement. Now he finds my habitat improvements. I'm not overpressuring him. They're running parallel to my borders. And guess what, a lot of times he stays. He comes through as a two-year-old, three-year-old wandering buck that doesn't have his own place because there's some four and five-year-olds around that are kicking his tail end. And he actually comes on the property. He likes what I'm offering. He stays as a two or three year old. The next year you find, and this is where we find this pattern a lot, we found over and over again. This is going back years. This isn't something I made up last year. This is something I've observed for 20 years or more in a lot of these concepts. He comes on the property as a young buck. The next year you see him coming in earlier and staying longer during the hunting season. He comes in earlier. And pretty soon you have him the majority of the hunting season focusing on your land during the daylight hours, the most consistent property in his wheelhouse the entire season. You've got his daylight movement. You've cornered the market on attracting him and holding him and even advancing him to the next age class if he's young. And guess what? When he comes as a four or five year old, a three year old, depending on the age class in your area that you like to promote, he comes in, he follows those paralleling habitat improvements because they all lead to another habitat improvement. They go by all your stands, they go by all your cameras. You can tell which direction he's coming from, probably what land he's living on, depending on where he comes into the property. And those paralleling habitat features, we talk about inside out properties, making sure the deer are living and focusing on your print land during the daylight and then moving out at night instead of moving from outside in. Talk about perpendicular access, perpendicular movements. So you're moving as a hunter into these lines, perpendicular to this line movement. That's another video. Talk about depth of cover. So you're maintaining as much depth as you have between food and cover so that you allow mature bucks to have a chance of living in. We talk about doe layering, where you have food, screening, doe, and fam doe family group bedding, and then buck bedding. You have to have that in that order. Talk about all the water holes, mock scrapes. Put it all together in something like this. And those paralleling habitat features are key. You have to have paralleling habitat features around your land, whichever way they match up the best on your land. And you'll find not only will it move the deer in the direction you want and not off your land, to your neighbors. You know, the opposite is having that two-acre food plot that points right at your borders. I've seen even people get countless deer killed on the side of the road because their food plot points at the road. And obviously, the stronger the food plot, the stronger the road, the more deer, you, or the more, uh, stronger the movement, the more deer you kill. Instead, keep those deer parallel to your borders, moving on your borders. It helps capture bucks when they're moving during the dark hours in their three-mile home range. It helps capture them for the daylight movement. It moves them past your trail cameras. You can use a, a smaller number of trail cameras to actually capture the total number of bucks that you're in your area. And in the end, hey, all after all this, they move by your tree stands.
So the older that buck gets, you have this defined movement, pretty easy to go in there and shoot that mature box. In fact, I found the older, and this is another video too, but the older they get, the easier they are to pattern a mature buck is. The only downfall is if you apply too much hunting pressure, they're more reactive to hunting pressure. But if you let these patterns take place, including that parallel movement, then it becomes a whole lot easier not only to attract, hold, grow, and advance that buck to the next age class, but to shoot him when he's at the age that you want to shoot him at, and you've already given him that movement. You just need to determine the timing of the stand if he's a non or non-core buck or a core buck, move into them. And the Paraline Habitat features are a big part of that. I hope that makes sense. And it's a and very important, um, amazing concept that you can apply to your small parcel this season, right now, planning ahead and enjoy this hunting season.